Would you bow with me in prayer as we prepare to look at the text of Scripture this morning? Heavenly Father, we bow again in humility, recognizing that we are unequal to the task before us. To understand and apply your word all by ourselves won't happen. Uh, We need your help. For me to preach the word in some way that would make it more palatable for people or that would make people want to accept it or follow you because of my ingenious words or winsome personality is certainly not going to happen. And so we ask for your help this morning. We recognize that if anything good is going to come from this time together, it's because you're working in us and among us through your word and your spirit. Lord, fill your people with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit as I proclaim your word. May I proclaim it clearly and faithfully. And may may you use your word this morning, even the difficult things that are in it, to convict us of sin in our own hearts and change us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. That's our desire. Please work among us with your spirit and may we submit to you. We also pray for our sister Judy as she's um, at home resting after uh, spending some time in the ER last night. I pray that it would, that uh, she, that what's, whatever's going on in her body would be treatable, that doctors would have wisdom and grace to help her and that she would get good rest today and be refreshed in the week to come. And now Lord God, bless our time together for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Families are complicated. We try to make a team out of a bunch of separate individuals with different expectations, different goals, different likes. And often we make a mess of things, especially when those expectations and goals start to conflict. And from what I understand about first century families and households, it would have been even more complicated. They had multiple generations often living under one roof, and and in addition to that, household slaves and servants. And it it sort of makes sense when we read the New Testament and we see passages like 1 Timothy 3 where Paul tells Timothy that a pastor or an elder must be able to manage his own household well for the church is sort of like a family, isn't it? We talked about that a bit last week. We are a diverse group of people who who ideally are working toward a common goal. But in reality, we feel a lot of the same tensions within the body of Christ that we do within our families, don't we? Particularly when our expectations and our likes conflict. But the church is slightly different than a family in that we are bound together by Christ and by his spirit. The one who created the universe is the one who binds us together in the church. And that means that we have hope, hope beyond even the nuclear families that we are a part of, that we can unite together in spite of our differences. And Matthew 16, 13 through Matthew 18, 35, these two and a half chapters are all about that church, that group of people that God has bound together in Christ. Jesus introduces the church in response, you'll remember, to Peter's confession of faith in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, promising when he does that the gates of Hades, that is, death itself, will not overpower the church. And that that he is going to give the church unique kingdom authority here on earth. We're not the kingdom, but we have unique kingdom authority. From Matthew 16, 21 through the end of chapter 18, Jesus' teaching focuses on explaining these two realities, these two promises. We saw the significance of the resurrection in the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 16, 21 through 17, 23. There, 
in the transfiguration, Jesus is trying to tell the disciples that the church will be glorified in the resurrection, our bodily resurrection, just like Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were on that mountain that day. Death isn't the end. So the church must live like death isn't the end. We talked about that a few weeks ago. But beginning in Matthew 17, 24, then, Jesus presents the church as a family and these unique relationships and responsibilities that we have, particularly with regard to the kingdom and the keys of the kingdom. He confronts our desire to keep our relationship with Jesus private. That's, that's what we often want to do. We want to keep everything private. And instead, he emphasizes our bond in Christ and our responsibilities as family members in God's household within the church itself. And that drives home this one big idea that Matthew wants us to get from this narrative, from these narratives, maybe you could say. Uh, The big idea that we started talking about last week, and we're going to kind of carry that over, that God makes all true disciples his children. Therefore, we must accept our fellow believers as family. God makes all disciples his children. Therefore, we must accept fellow believers as our family. And as we began talking about this big idea, this this truth last week, we asked how would the daily recognition that our fellow believers are our new forever family change our lives. How should that make us act differently here with each other? And we identified last week three life-changing realities that evidence this acceptance of each other as family. We talked about the fact that we join as family who believes. So we talked about how to get into the family. We believe and repent from Matthew 18, 1 through 4. We also talked about the fact that we grow as family who encourages, that we don't tear each other down, we don't try to cause each other to sin, we're seeking to build each other up, not tear each other down. That's Matthew 18, 5 through 10. And then we talked about loving as family who cares. We love as family who cares. This is Matthew 18, 12 through 14, and that parable of the lost sheep, which sort of flows right into our fourth Uh, life-changing reality. We're going to add two more this morning. The first, or fourth, is that we discipline as family who restores. We discipline as family who restores. Look with me at chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. He says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by, the, by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. When it comes to the keys of the kingdom, this passage has important implications It's important to note that verse 18 is almost a direct restatement of Matthew 16, 19. After Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven in verse 19, he says, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed on heaven. So this restatement ties these two passages together intricately and it connects these ideas. So the context here in chapter 18 tells us that when Jesus is talking about the keys of the kingdom, he's talking about church discipline. Now let's talk about church discipline. This will be a fun topic, right? What is church discipline? If your first thought of church discipline is kicking somebody out of the church membership, excommunicating them, whatever you want to call it, then we need to adjust some things because it's bigger than that. The New Testament commands believers to admonish and rebuke each other. 
not only here, but in other places. The word translated, show him his fault, in the NASB, here, is used to, in the pastoral epistles, multiple times, to reference the role that pastors have in exposing and convicting of sin in the lives of the congregation. Colossians 3.16 uses a related word. In fact, Colossians uses this other word twice, one in Coloss- once in Colossians 1, where it says that we admonish each other, and Colossians 3.16, which says this, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. So apparently admonishing, rebuking, can even happen when we're singing truth to each other. It also, the same word that's used in Colossians is used in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, and I think this might be the most significant of the verses. We urge you, brethren, that means all of you, admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. There's a good summary of your responsibilities as a church member. All of this, though, is church discipline. All of it. All preaching, all individual rebuke, all counseling, all encouraging, it all has to do with church discipline. It doesn't, it's not just the end of removing someone, it's also the process. In fact, the whole process outlined in Matthew 18 is church discipline. Not just the end. So that's what church discipline is. It's just any time our sin is confronted and God is convicting us to change and repent. But why do we do it? Why do we do church discipline? Well, Matthew 18 actually gives us a hint as to, as to why we do it. Jesus emphasizes that church discipline is to, for the restoration of our brother. To, he, sa- he says to win your brother there in verse 15, right? If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. Why? If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Your goal is to restore them, to get them to where they ought to be spiritually. There's another reason in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the passage that I read to begin the service, in verses 6 and 7, Paul adds that that church discipline helps protect the purity of the church. This This is what it says there. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. And Paul actually alludes to a second, or a third, I should say, reason for church discipline, and that is to, if they're unrepentant, to in some way uh, save the person who is, uh, who, in 1 Corinthians 5, to save the person who's sinning. To deliver him over to Satan. And so we have these reasons for church. It's primarily for restoration and to maintain the purity of the church. This is what we want to happen within the church of Jesus Christ. But what does it look like? Well, Jesus gives us a pretty specific definition or maybe like outline of what it looks like here. Step one is to go to our brother or sister alone to confront their sin. I want to emphasize that it's alone. We're not making a, we're not trying to broadcast everybody's sins around. Confrontation is hard for most of us. That's difficult for us to do For some people, they maybe like it too much. I feel like we kind of fall on two spectrums. We either hate confrontation or we like confrontation and we confront about everything. But if we don't handle confrontation right, then we'll we'll just serve to make the problem worse within the church. We're not going to restore our brother and we're not going to maintain the purity of the church if we don't do confrontation right. So I want to talk for just a moment about this and offer you some instruction regarding confrontation. And this... This is for all of us. We all need to do this. This is especially for those who maybe love to confront because you probably need to be reined back a little. First, we must only confront clear violations of the commands of Scripture. Sometimes a person's choice might be just an issue of conscience. And in those cases, when it's not clearly outlined in Scripture, okay, so if your brother or sister lies... That is a clear command in Scripture that we, should, we ought not lie, right? 
But if your but if your brother watches a movie that you've determined you shouldn't watch, that's really a matter of conscience. Now, there could be immoral content in the movie, and that's a different issue. But let's just assume all things being equal that there isn't, and that, that for whatever reason you've determined you shouldn't, wa- you shouldn't watch this movie, but they did, that's, that's an issue of conscience. I, I, I would maybe even say political opinions would fall under this as well, that you can be sinful in your political choices, but often it's not a sinful choice. And so in those cases, we need to assume the best about each other. We need to hold to our convictions. I'm not saying we shouldn't have convictions. Hold them and hold them strongly and listen carefully to our brother and sister in Christ. Have a conversation. That's helpful. If you see something that maybe warrants a warning for a potential blind spot, you could offer that, but don't, it's not the same as confronting them. And you could even offer to hold them accountable. But just leave it there. We don't have to, we have to go through the church discipline process for matters of conscience. The point isn't to make everyone look like us. It's to, it's to make us all look like Jesus. And assume you may not have it right either. So be gracious in that. Another um, thing about confrontation is that we have to be careful about abusing power. I find that people who like to confront like to confront people who are weaker than them. We often do this with children. We're quick to confront children, and, and often in anger, because, we have a, because of the huge power differential. It may frustrate you that children often seem out of control and disrespectful. But unless it is clearly disrespect, let's assume sometimes the best about our kids that maybe it's just kids being kids. Kids have more energy than we do. They like to run. They're often loud. They even break things. It's kind of the way kids are. There's no reason for us to rip into them just because they're a child and we're an adult and we're bigger than they are. Instead, what what our children need is not harsh confrontation. They need loving discipleship. And just because you're not their parent doesn't mean you can't lovingly disciple. In fact, I don't think we'd probably have any parents here, and I'm speaking as a parent in this room, who wouldn't love for you to lovingly disciple their children. Another thing. Remember that the goal is restoration, not punishment. I think this is where things really go awry for us. We often think the goal is to punish our brother or sister, not to restore them. Too often, we get joy out of exposing our brother or sister's sin rather than seeing them restored. In verses 12 through 14, the shepherd looks for the one sheep to bring it back, not to punish it or berate it. The goal is not public disgrace. That's not what we're going for with church discipline. It's restoration, and this requires humility and a recognition that every single one of us is a sinner. That's why we needed to be saved in the first place. That's why we're here, isn't it? Because we're all sinners in need of a gracious and merciful God, not because we're better than each other. Can we please get over that? To punish the wayward sheep is to act as though we don't need mercy ourselves. So that's step one. Step one is to go to your brother alone and confront them. And confront them with some grace, please. Because if you confront them harshly, and if you're looking merely to punish your brother or sister in Christ, I can guarantee you one thing. You won't restore them. But if you love them, There's hope for restoration. Step two is to take two or more with you. So if they don't repent when you go to them alone, if they're stubborn about it, then take two, one or two others with you and go talk to them again. Now the point of these one or two isn't because they saw the sin and they're witnesses of it. That's not what it means by the by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact being confirmed. What they are there to do is to witness the response. They are to further encourage repentance in the individual, and they actually serve to prepare for the last step if we need to get to that last step. 
Jesus isn't saying that you can't confront sin in one of your brothers or sisters unless, one, unless two or three people have witnessed it. Those one or two who come with you may know very little about the sin that's been committed until you confront your brother or sister. And we need to be careful about spreading gossip in this realm. Because we're not trying to, remember, we're not trying to destroy them. We're trying to restore them. And Jesus doesn't say it here, but the goal is still the same, to win our brother. But they may still refuse. So they've refused you alone. They've now refused you with two or three others, or one or two others. Now what do we do? We take it to the church. We tell it to the church. We gather the whole body and the other witnesses testify then in front of the congregation to the tone of our confrontation. I think they should speak to the tone of our confrontation that it was gracious as it ought to be and then also to the unrepentance of the individual and only then if they don't respond to the church. So the church in that case should then call them one last time, please repent, you need to do right. And if they refuse yet again, then and only then are they removed from the church. And notice this, that to us, they are no longer a brother. That's what he means by call, saying he's a Gentile and a tax collector. He's, he's using words that the, that the Jews would have thought about and the disciples would have thought of as saying, oh, they're not a part of God's people. We're, we have to be really careful here that we don't give false assurance to someone's profession of faith if they refuse to live like a Christian and submit to the church. And so we treat them as though they need to be saved, as though they weren't really a believer in the first place. They fooled us in the beginning. But what about the keys? That brings us back to this idea about the keys. What did they have to do with this? Because I haven't really talked about that at all yet. When Jesus gives us the keys of the kingdom, Via the disciples, remember, that is an authority and responsibility to identify true kingdom citizens. That is, the, that is what the keys signify. And when he says that whatever we bind or loose is bound or loosed in heaven, he is emphasizing that responsibility that we have and his agreement with our decision regarding membership and discipline. In other words, we bind those that we welcome into our church. So when we have a new member service and we welcome in new believers, we are binding them and they are bound in heaven. God is agreeing with us. And when we, lo when we practice church discipline and remove someone from our membership, we are loosing them and, and God is agreeing with our loosing, loosening of them. Verses 19 and 20 are often just isolated. Like we just love to pull verse 19 and verse 20 right out of the Bible and just use them for whatever we want. Um, out of context, verse 19 sounds like if you find another believer and you, you both say, yeah, you really need a, something or other, and you ask God for it, he's going to give it to you. You know, all you got to do is find somebody else to pray with you about it. In verse 20, I mean, well, you might even see this on a wall plaque somewhere, probably in a Christian coffee shop, because it sounds like if you gather together with one or two other fellow Christians, that then, then Jesus is in the midst, is, is with you when you gather. And, and that's, that's a nice thought. The, the fact is, is it's always true, okay? Jesus is always with you. Hebrews 13, 5, if, if you're wondering, okay? So, so don't worry, you don't have to get two or three of us together to get Jesus there. He's there, he's with you. His spirit indwells you. He's with you all the time. But um, in the context of this passage, these two verses sort of say the same thing and they're really reiterating verse 18 because you'll notice something. Jesus says at the beginning of verse 8, truly I say to you, and then at the beginning of verse 19, again I say to you, he repeats that, I say to you to tie this together. And then the two or three is connected in verses 19 and 20. So all of this is connected. It's just one big context. Don't, don't, Pull it out. So verse 19 is pointing to our asking God to ratify our decision of either membership or discipline to agree with us. And verse 20 is Jesus' promise that he will do just that. Jesus is here. It's, so when we make a membership decision, Jesus, it's like Jesus is in the room with us and saying, yep, they're right. In other words, when we make a spirit-filled decision to add or remove someone from our membership, God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, are right 
there with us, agreeing with our decision. And if that makes you a little nervous, it should. That means that what we're doing, we should take very, very seriously. This is not something that we do carelessly. Either welcoming members in or kicking them out. And we're, we're always like hey, gung-ho about welcoming people in. Like, yeah, more members, woohoo! And And then also, but then we tend to be a little bit more like, well, I don't know if I want to let them go. Right, because we're just looking at the numbers and we want that number to be high. We can't think about it like that. We just have to take this really seriously and what we're aiming for is what? The restoration of our brother and the purity of the church. We don't want to give false assurance to someone who doesn't understand the gospel and we don't want to remove assurance from someone who is, uh, who is repentant, who is, who's actually turning from sin and trying to live a godly life. And now you might ask, are you saying, Pastor Rory, that we get to decide who gets into heaven and who doesn't? Well, yeah and no. Yes and no. I'm going to say yes and no on that, okay? Obviously, we don't see the heart, and we don't know where anybody is at, okay? And I concede that. But God has given us some pretty clear clues as to whether someone is a true believer or not. One is their confession of faith that Peter confessed in Matthew 16. 16. If they don't say that Jesus Christ is the Son of is, is the Messiah, the son of the living God, and they don't believe that you are saved only by faith in his name, then they're not a Christian, right? So we, profession, that's what they say. But it's easy to say something and not, ha- not follow up on it, right? But remember what Jesus taught a few chapters ago? In Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20, he said this, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile a man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Yes, we cannot see the heart, but we can see the fruits of the heart. And if someone is not living like a Christian should. They're embracing those attitudes and those hearts uh, and actions that Jesus just condemned in Matthew 15. That reveals that they're not really a believer in the first place, especially if they're unrepentant. It's not that you can't commit those sins. It's that if you commit them and don't repent, you're not restored. Anyone acting in these ways is exposing his heart to us and he's giving us all the reason in the world to remove their assurance of salvation to say, you know what, we're not really sure you're a true disciple because you're not even trying to act like one and you don't seem to care about your sin. Also, remember, Jesus gives them three chances to repent here, right? You go by yourself, you bring two or three, one or two with you, and then you tell it to the church. Three strikes, you're out. This is a big deal. And it's a significant implication of our responsibility as the church. We have to take this really seriously. But it's not the end. We not only have an external re- responsibility when it comes to the keys of the kingdom, I think we have a, a, an internal one as well. And Jesus talks about that in verses 21 through 35, the last reality that evidences acceptance of fellow believers as family. And that is we forgive as family forgiven. We forgive as family forgiven. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle an account with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Peter's question here could have been motivated by two uh, by a couple different reasons, I think. It could be because he's thinking about the, the sinning that needed confrontation in verses 15 through 20, and uh, he's wondering how often he needs to forgive his brother if he sins against him and has to confront it. He could also even have been thinking about a brother maybe sinfully confronting him and, and just being a jerk and, and not treating him with respect. How many times do I have to deal with this? Either way, his thought, or he thought he was being really generous by saying, hey, how about seven times? You know, like, that's probably about, that's good, isn't it? If I, if I forgive my brother seven times? But Jesus wants him to think beyond how many times. He kind of minimizes that, and he illustrates the truth with a parable. And this parable illustrates a few things, and, and really two important things about us as humans that I want you to understand. First is that we underestimate our own sin. You underestimate how sinful you are. That first slave owed a debt of 10,000 talents, and, and it probably Jesus' point there is that it was just unpayable. It's like an extreme number that nobody can imagine. But if you do the math on how much a talent was worth and other things, this guy owed essentially the national debt. It was 60 million denarii. 60 million. A denarius was a day's wage for a common laborer in that day. So he owed the king 60 million days wages. Just for the record, that's 164,000, more than 164,000 years of a day's wage that he owed him. Now, perhaps this guy was maybe not just a day laborer. Maybe he was a middle-class Roman citizen. For that, for that person, they maybe make 5,000 denarii a year rather than just 365. It still would take 12 thousand years to pay off. If he was among the wealthiest of Roman citizens and he paid every dime, every denarius, I should say, that he got to his debt, it would still take him 24 years to pay off this debt. I think it's safe to say he probably wasn't wealthy since he was a slave, but all those numbers just prove that this is an enormous debt and make no mistake that is what your sin is like before a holy god we just sang holy 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 and come ye sinners poor and needy poor and needy that's us before god this parable does a great job of illustrating for us how horrible our sin is before God. Our sin puts us in an unimaginable debt. We tend to react like the slave, though. <laughs> Did you catch what he said? Please have, be patient with me, and I will repay you everything. Everything? Really? Are you that optimistic? Do you really think that much of yourself that you can figure out a way to make all this right before God if you think that you are underestimating your own sin. But don't we tend to do that? Don't we tend to underestimate our own sin? But we don't just underestimate our sin. We also overestimate the sin of others. Did you notice how after the king forgives the slave's debt, he, he then makes a huge deal out of his fellow slave's 100 denarii debt. So 660 million denarii versus 100 denarii. And those 100 denarii were so important to him that he runs up to his fellow slave, grabs him, begins to choke him, and demands that he pays. And even when the slave says the exact same words to him, that he said to his Lord, he throws the slave in prison until he could pay it all. We tend to see our sin against God as not that bad and the sin of others against us as huge, enormous. Do you ever notice how little tolerance you have for others when they do the exact same thing to you that you do to others? I see this particularly in my driving. I won't illustrate it for you, but I think you can probably imagine. We need to get a realistic picture of ourselves from Scripture. 
instead of inventing a sanitized version of ourselves compared with everyone around us. And, and as we view ourselves through sort of like rose-colored glasses and everybody else with this picture of reality. Jesus makes his main point in this parable clear, though. It's not really just that we underestimate our own sin and overestimate the sin of others. His point is in verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. His point is this. It is impossible for someone who has truly been forgiven by God not to forgive his brother in Christ. It's impossible. That's not to say that we're not tempted not to forgive. It's not to say it's not difficult to forgive. It is difficult extremely difficult, and we are often tempted to hold on to the hurt. It's not to say we won't struggle through it, but the depth and heinousness of our own sin is the most important part of the gospel message, right? We need to understand that we cannot save ourselves. It is through God's imputed righteousness, not because we're good, not because we're better than everybody else outside the church, but because God in his mercy saved us. We are awful, horrible sinners. And that is so important to the gospel that to fail to forgive others is to essentially deny our own sin. And it's to deny the gospel. And that leads to another question. What is forgiveness? If I'm supposed to forgive, and if it's that important, if I'm actually showing people that I'm not, that I don't understand the gospel if I don't forgive, how do I do it? And this parable defines it for us. Sin creates a sort of debt for us that is owed to those against whom the sin is committed. Okay, so when we, when we commit a sin against somebody, there's this, we kind of like, it goes in the debt pile. And if, if we sin against God, it goes in the debt pile. It's something we owe, we have to make up for. And, and justice does, tr- does this by trying to make up for the crimes of people. It's sort of like there's this what you owe and they try to make restitution and, and try to make things right. When someone sins against us, we desperately want to even the score. We want, those, we want those columns to equal out what's owed and what we owe others. When the king called in the slave who owed him the national debt, he was trying to even the score, trying to even the, the ledger. The, the slave had something that belonged to the king and he wanted it back. When the king realized that the slave couldn't pay it, it was impossible for him to pay it. Even if he sold him, by the way, he wouldn't have paid it. He released him from it. The king determined that he would wipe the debt from his books. And that's forgiveness. Forgiveness is choosing to eliminate the sin of a person who hurts us from the accounts receivable column and write it off as a loss. It's a conscious choice not to hold the sin of someone else against that person or to attempt to even the score. That is really hard. And as I mentioned before, it's often a a struggle. I have had situations in my own life where I have had to work to forgive others for multiple days, even months, before God helped me and things started to get easier. That doesn't mean it was was over. Just where things started to get easier to forgive. And notice this isn't something that we have to say It isn't something you have to, I I forgive you. It's not the words that come out because Jesus says it comes from our heart. You forgive them from your heart. And this is a big problem. I am aware of multiple people from this congregation. I've only been the pastor here for less than four years. And I am aware of several people who were once a part of our congregation who refused to forgive others for hurts that they received. They also refused to confront and discipline as Jesus commanded and they eventually just left. They are hanging on to the sins that they had instead of forgiving. And I see evidence of this some now, even within our congregation. And I'm sorry to get, if I'm, if I'm getting too personal, but I think this is really important. Some of you still are refusing to trust your brothers and sisters because they've hurt you in the past. Some of you refuse a relationship with your brothers or sisters because of something that they've done to you. And let me tell you what will happen. If you continue to act in this way, it will eventually eat at you until you cannot be here anymore. You can't be around the person. You can't even be in a space that reminds you of the person, and you'll run from the problem. 
You'll leave the church without telling me or anyone else why you're leaving and leave in your wake even more hurt people. I've seen it numerous times, not just here, but in my previous ministry, because people who leave because they refuse to forgive know that they are leaving for a bad reason and know that they have no grounds on which they ought to leave the church and so they don't tell anyone, they just leave and they hope that no one will ask. You're hanging on to that hurt and in your mind you're punishing that person by refusing to forgive them and trying to get even with your bitterness but you're really only hurting yourself and the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. Pursue peace with all men. Let's, I think we could probably say that that could be part of forgiveness is pursuing peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. That's Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. Stop trying to get even. Get an idea of what God did for you and start forgiving. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Maybe it's time for us to start directing some of our anger and malice toward our sin instead of toward our brother and sister who hurt us. And it's time for us to forgive. Because it's impossible to be a Christian and never forgive. Impossible. Because you can't, you can't understand the gospel if you don't understand forgiveness. When God saved us, he made us a part of his household and we must act like it. I think it's significant that Jesus spends the last part of this chapter talking so much about sin as he's talking about the church. I think he's preparing us for a fact that things won't be perfect. In our consumeristic society, we, uh, we're often looking, uh, you know, go shopping for the perfect church. I mean, we even may give lip service to the fact that there is no perfect church. But we still have these expectations and selfishness in us that makes us want all of these things and we act differently. And that leaves us to open to disappointment and bitterness when sin rears its ugly head. And sin will rear its ugly head even within the church. But there is a solution to sin in the church. And it's, it's basically the gospel of Jesus Christ, but here Jesus outlines it for us, loving discipline and gracious forgiving. That's how we answer sin in the church. If we could lovingly discipline and graciously forgive, Jesus provided us with the perfect solution to, to all of the imperfections that we bring and, and it restores the imperfect church into something that can look like Jesus and that's our goal. But for it to work, we need to humble ourselves. We have to become vulnerable to hurt. We have to be ready to confront. And we have to be willing to forgive. God has designed the church to work in spite of its imperfections. The gates of Hades still won't overpower the church even with its imperfections. And we still hold the keys of the kingdom in spite of our imperfections. But it takes all of us working together as a family toward that goal to make us like Jesus Christ. Will you be part of the solution? Maybe you need, to encourage, maybe you need some encouragement today. Maybe you need some accountability. Maybe you need to confess either unforgiveness or an unwillingness to confront. Maybe there's a sin that you, need to try, that you know about within your brother or sister that you need to lovingly confront, lovingly confront. That's why God gave us each other. That's what the church is supposed to be, and that's why the church can't happen digitally. That's why we gotta meet. That's why we need to encourage each other, help each other, be honest with each other and help each other grow, encourage each other. May we discipline and forgive in the same gracious love that we've received from God in Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy. I am well aware that I am not the most qualified person for saying all of this. I don't always confront when I need to, and I'm certainly not always forgiving right away when I need to. But I thank you for the things you've taught me about these, these things and the ways that you're changing my heart. And I pray you'd change all of our hearts. Lord, we are humbled before you because we know that we have received an enormous debt forgiven, 
a pile of sin that we can't fathom, that violates your holiness in ways that we don't understand. But you are a merciful and gracious God, and through your Son, Jesus Christ, you've chosen to make salvation available to us and impute righteousness to our account instead of a debt of sin. What wondrous grace is this? May we respond to your love and mercy with love and mercy toward each other. May we lovingly confront and graciously forgive whatever we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.